So thank you all very much. And those of you that are online and, and uh, have um, connected in remotely, to, so welcome to December Grand Rounds for the Academic UBC Department of Emergency Medicine. And um, it's kind of a bit odd because I usually um, introduce the speaker. Today the speaker is me. So um, I'm Jim Christensen, the, the head of the department. And um, I'm delighted actually to be able to share a story and a journey that we've been on for a couple of years. And um, it's not over yet by any means, but it, it is related to emergency care in remote indigenous communities. And we, um, we have a guest here today with us, Julia Atlio, who's going to um, come and, and give us some impressions of sort of what we've been doing and about emergency care in her community in Ahousit. And so I want to take you on that journey and talk about um, what we've learned. It's been um, really a fulfilling um, project and time for me and, and uh, for Sharla. And, um, We've, um, uh, we think we're doing some, some really good work and we're poised to do even, even greater good work. And, um, and at the same time, we've, we've learned a lot and actually gained a lot by the experience of working um, with remote indigenous communities. So before we start that, we want to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, peoples, including the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. It is something that I sort of felt badly, but we probably should be doing that in the future. We will do that all the time, but we have not done that in the past. And so it's interesting what these kind of individual projects can trigger, but um, it is that solemn recognition of where we're meeting. So the emergency department, uh, or the, the emergency medicine network grew from the need um, of the academic department of emergency medicine to be in touch with places where clinical care really happens. And that's all around the province. What you see in front of you there is the vision for the emergency medicine network. And um, exceptional emergency care, we talked a lot about that. That's what we want to be able to deliver ideally, but everywhere in the province was, um, was again something that we felt very strongly about. When we started that, we actually were focused on emergency departments that were attached to hospitals in uh, BC. But we recognized that emergencies actually happen not just in emergency departments, they happen in GP's offices, they happen in, um, in communities that don't have emergency departments that might have physicians, they happen in, in communities that don't have physicians. And, um, and so it challenged us to think about what does that mean to actually go well beyond what our typical kind of world is all about. And when we think about places where we don't have really good health care, we think about third world countries and, and, and you know, the, the, the health care services that are available there. When we put a map up and we show from whatever metric you want to use um, to show um, what, uh, how much money is spent on health care, Canada always fares pretty well. We, and we have pretty good metrics from the point of view of healthcare quality, but it's not uniform across Canada. And in our province, there's certainly areas where emergency care, which is what we're specifically talking about here, is really not anywhere near where we would like to see it. And so that's why we chose to go forward with this project um, to try to look and understand what emergency care in Indigenous communities um, what it was and how the network might be able to help. And just a little example, those pictures at the bottom, that's a, a little eight-year-old boy in a remote community in Ontario, Jedediah is his name. He fell and broke his arm. Um, and that's the, the emergency response that he got. And then it took 48 hours to get him to some place where he could get an X-ray of his arm and be taken care of. And that's not uncommon in some of many, many remote communities. So the purpose of this project, and it was a, a project called a, from the Strategic Investment Fund. So first we applied the Faculty of Medicine, of course, and the, and the Ministry of Health has um, really high strategic priorities to try to deal with the health issues in Indigenous communities. And so we applied for a, a small, smallish grant with the faculty and we got it. 
And what we were trying to do was to understand the emergency care needs and priorities in BC's Indigenous communities. And all through partnership development and culturally sensitive approaches, which of course all of that is very, um, is very, is very clear. And I think you've heard that sort of um, the need to do that before. And we want to identify opportunities where collaboration with the Emergency Medicine Network could actually be beneficial and try to improve outcomes in these uh, communities. And when we first started looking at it and exploring it, we um, there, there were three actually main domains or issues that um, that were concerning and that we thought maybe we could have um, uh, some sort of impact on. And the first was obvious was in remote communities where they're really um, it's really difficult access and there's not a lot of um, resources within the community. And that's where we landed. And so that's what I'm going to talk about mostly today because we decided to focus on that. But that's not the only issue that Indigenous peoples have. Um, the, the other one was fear of institutions. And so even in places like, uh, particularly, we were made aware of elders and chiefs in, um, in Port Alberni. They have access to a pretty good hospital in Port Alberni. But um, there, those that um, were institutionalized as children are afraid to go to a hospital because it brings back all these memories and they have these fears of how they're going to be treated. So that's, that's a real issue and it does impact a little bit on, on what we're going to talk about, but it, um, it, it even is an issue where there is access to reasonable emergency care. And of course, and from um, our, our urban hospitals, there's lots of um, Indigenous patients who come in and, and there's a recognition now and there's some work going on to try to see if we can make sure all the staff are, cult are, are sensitive to the cultural needs and the different ways we perhaps should be approaching Indigenous people in our emergency departments to give them the best possible experience that we can. But for today and for this, this project, this major project, we're going to focus on, um, on remote Indigenous communities. So we wanted to deliver an approach and a model that could uh, be a foundation to engaging future communities. So we want to start in some way and sort of like a pilot and um, use that socially accountable approach that respects the communities, recognizes them fully as partners and, and transforms emergency care through practice education, knowledge sharing and advocacy. And the steering committee included people that it's just been a joy to work with, with a huge amount of experience um, you can see them there, and I'm grateful to every single person on here. They have special areas of expertise. Many are from have indigenous roots, and um, and and experience in dealing with this. So we we knew that it was important to really um, understand because I didn't know a lot about it, and I needed to be educated as we went forward to make sure I didn't um, uh, mess things up. I guess. Where we ended up um, being um, involved in focusing on were four indigenous, remote indigenous communities um, on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So Tlaquiat is, uh, is around Tofino area. It's the least remote. And Ahauzet, and that's where Julie is from, um, is, uh, is just up the coast. It's an, I'll show you in a minute. It's about a 45-minute boat ride, maybe 60, maybe worse in rough, rough weather. Um, to get from Tofino to there. Hesquiat is um, hot springs. You might have known it and heard of it as hot springs. And it um, is a little farther up the coast. And then um, Cayuquit is um, way up the coast and uh, the, most the most distant and isolated. And the partners that we brought into this included those nations, but also the tribal council, um, the Indigenous Health Education Access Research Training Center, that's iHeart, right? So Rebecca, Rebecca is here, she was on that list I just showed you and worked with Jeff Redding from there. Um, BC um, Emergency Health Services, Vancouver Island Health Authority, First Nations Health Authority, Heart and Stroke, um, the UBC Faculty of Medicine, um, Intercultural Online Health Network, which Kendall Ho runs, and he does that with different cultures, including Indigenous people, and in trying to improve health literacy. Um, TELUS, Justice Institute of BC, Providence, um, uh, the Nursing Nichelnuth Way, and um, Academic Health Science Network. So 
we brought all those people in and engaged them in this project. And then we started on this process of discovery. So the first meeting that we had was in Tofino in October. Is that two years ago? Oh, all right. Wow. And um, so two years ago, we had our first meeting where we brought people from those four communities together. And it was a beautiful October day in Tofino. And it was just a wonderful day of meeting people and, and learning. Um, and I even thought to myself, as I was sort of doing this, I thought, wow, this is work. Wow, this is pretty cool. I, um, I really enjoyed it. And um, through that process, and we learned some of these things um, uh, later on, so not just sort of right at that, at that point, but we sort of developed a little um, a picture of kind of what, what the resources are available in those communities. And so you can have a, a look here. I'm, I don't need to go through every single one of them, but it, it varies if you need to get somebody out of a community and you can get a helicopter in, that's probably the best case scenario, but often that's not possible. So you can see that um, in, uh, the, the access can be 45 to 60 minutes for a house it by boat if the weather is okay to be able to do that. But in uh, Cayuquit, it's uh, you have to take a boat and then a car to get across the island to Campbell River, and that's about a five-hour journey. Um, Tlaquit is, is sort of variable because there's multiple little communities within Tlaquit. And then, um, and then Heshquit, again, it's, um, it's significant time by boat to get down and, uh, and to get help for somebody. And then you can look at the nurses in the second line there. And there is no continuous coverage for nurses in any of these communities. The one that really surprised me was in Heshquit when we went and visited there. Um, we went to the clinic and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not a bad building. It's sort of a bare bones clinic, not a lot of equipment there. Um, but there was a little sign on the door about nursing hours, and it was two hours a week that somebody comes in for, to provide nursing support. Um, a house it has a little more. Um, not really set up to do emergency kind of work in the clinic. It's more community and preventative and chronic illness kind of management, but four days a week. And a physician comes there um, two days a week. It's a bit variable, but um, for a clinic for four or five hours. And so you can see that the, in the other communities, there's rarely a doctor that's available. And then you look at the communications, and um, most didn't have very good communications, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So um, it was obvious that um, the reasons for not having good health care were multiple, but the, the, the basic access in, within the community was not what it was meant to be. So before we had that first meeting in Tofino, we took the day before and we journeyed to a house it, and um, we met Julia there, uh, and then she was with us the next day as well. So the left picture on the top is taking the, the, the water taxi to get to a house it, and it was a beautiful day, so we're very lucky. The water was flat. On the way back, we saw whales, you know, and it was, it was absolutely beautiful. That's not the way it, it always is, though, and the clinic is on, on top to your right there, um, and, and that's the clinic in a house. So we toured there and talked to people, and we toured around the whole community. And um, it, um, it, in fact, we were even really privileged to be involved if, um, with the ceremony. We met many of the elders in a circle, and, um, and, and there was a brushing ceremony, which apparently is, is not that common for visitors to be able to see. So we felt like right off the bat that we were so welcomed and um, and we vowed to make sure that, that we remained welcomed within the communities and able to, to help. So um, that was sort of the start of our journey. And then that whole next day, we met with representatives from other organizations, but also from those four communities. Well, we tried to understand um, just exactly what happens when there's an emergency need. And, and you can see you can see me up in the far right corner, and Julia's right there, too. So. Um, as we talked through that, we wanted to figure out what the main issues were that we might be able to deal with. And it was kind of cool because we hired a, uh, a graphic artist to listen for the whole day and um, try to capture in graphic form the discussions that were going on. So this is one of two um, graphic pages that we had and sort of tried to describe the interactions that were, uh, that were going on and the discussions that we were having. And from that, we developed, at the first, it was five themes. Um, so that we needed to focus on. And this came then from the community. These were the issues that were brought up to us. 
So there were communications challenges, community resources and readiness, transport transfer challenges, and then the need for more training and support for first responders and that collapsed with the demand on first responders because a lot of it was the support and the, and the training that was kind of needed. So we ended up kind of with four at the end of that. And um, as, we, um, as we talked about them, we had a lot more detail behind all of these, as you can see here, um, but we tried to coalesce them with a thematic analysis into those four to help us really understand and focus on it. But if I, just, if I just go back to that, the communication challenges were, were really quite amazing. So, you know, you walk into some sort of situation and problem solving like that, and from my perspective, you kind of tend to jump to, well, there's some obvious ways to deal with this, right? So say, well, why can't we get somebody to be able to call in? So first responders are mostly the people who, um, who respond to emergencies within the community. They live in the community. They've had a total of 15 hours of training and, um, and they have to make some pretty important decisions and take care of people that might be quite sick even. So why can't we get remotely with some virtual help for a phone or whatever to get somebody to help, help them? And the answer was, well, we don't have good cell service here. So, there is no way to connect. So they connect within the community at that point in and in how's it just by VHF radio. That's how they talk to each other because that's the most reliable communication system. So big infrastructure problems there. Um, the first responders, as I said, have, have minimal training and they were, they're stressed. There's no question. They're, they, um, they would like to be supported more. They would like to have more training. They would like to have the opportunities to debrief, and um, and it was like they were just at that point they're kind of left on their own. I'm going to show you that there's been some some improvements um, since then, but um, it was it was stark to us that these people with minimal training had that awesome responsibility, and really didn't have any support. And 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 some had actually gone to do training from these communities. But then they, they just felt after they had the training that it was just too much and they wouldn't be able to um, really provide the service. So the, the ones that were left are, were, were left kind of holding the bag. And um, in Heshquit, there are only two that are left there. So they have to cover the community 24-7, 365. Um, and then transfer challenges, of course. Um, I talk, talked about the, the remoteness and the, the difficulty of getting people in and out. But even by, uh, by air, it's difficult. And even if you had the weather, there wasn't, isn't a good system. You didn't know whether you call the Coast Guard to take somebody out, whether you call BC Ambulance, and BC Ambulance might not consider it to be an emergency. And sometimes you have to go through a bunch of people. And just to actually talk to somebody that might be able to get you an air transport out can take hours, right? See Julia here nodding, yes. So, um, so these were things that we thought we might be able to impact in some way. So then we had another meeting after that. We put that all together. We sent that out to community. And then we had a meeting in Port Alberni where we actually took those themes. And for a day, we, we put people in different tables and we tried to get more information and detail about the things that we might be able to do. And so that was a really um, interesting meeting. And it was this was in, in Port Alberni in this beautiful it's, uh, I think it's the New Chalneth Tribal Council offices there. Am I right? To shot? Oh, that's not shared. So I wasn't quite sure why we were there, but it's a beautiful building and looking out over the river. And, um, and then uh, we had a subsequent meeting in Heskwit. Heskwit wanted us to come up to, the, to see the community, but also wanted to host... And, um, and we thought this was a great opportunity to bring in these first responders and just talk to more of them than we had at the first meetings because they could come in then. And we did that. It became a much bigger meeting than we had planned from the first responders. So we had, um, but we tried to focus it on those, the, the first responder issues. And, um, and we were very fortunate to have some of our partners that I'll talk about in a minute come and, um, and listen to the discussions and listen to the needs. And um, there was... And, and an instance right there where just because we'd been meeting and BCEHS had been meeting with us, then they'd had some external meetings when they went away 
And at that meeting, they presented all the first responders and gave out cards that they could distribute in these four communities with a card that had the number for the paramedic specialist in Vancouver. And they had committed already at that point to say, you know, if you can get, if you've got a phone and you can get out and you need some help, call the paramedic specialist who give advice to paramedics all across the province. Um, but they were willing to actually give advice to first responders who really are not part of, of the CEHS and the provincial pre-hospital response. So um, this was the first phase as we did this sort of discovery and came together. But um, we thought it was really important and in keeping with how we're trying to do this project to have our guest Julia um, come and just say a few words to you all about the need, about what goes on with emergencies in her community in particular. Um, Julia was a first responder at some point, so has that knowledge and experience and, and just uh, share with you some of her thoughts. So Julia, do you want to come forward? Thank you very much. If you just stand here, the mic will be able to pick up. Good morning, everybody. My name is Julia Atlio. My traditional name is Hayanoia, which means crystal. And I am really honored to be here today. I was uh, a first responder probably five, six years ago. And it's a very challenging job as a first responder because uh, you have incidents like at one point there was a, a young man who put his arm through a van window and he didn't make it because of, there was no water taxi service available that morning and um, he he made it to the hospital in Tofino, but after that he was gone. So the lack of service in the house by um, boat or airplane this time of the year is the most difficult, um, especially with the weather. Uh, a lot of times we have to call our Coast Guard, which we ha it goes to Prince Rupert, to Victoria, to Tofino, then I mean, it's a real long process, about two to four hours for any response from the Coast Guard to come to our community. We used to have a big vessel, but it was uh, costing too much for our community. It used to be able to take emergency such on this time of the year. Um, the... That's one of the, the really struggles we have this time of the year, especially with our elders. We have uh, probably 10 elders, and out of those 10, we have about four who are in, not very healthy. <laughs> and, you know, uh, it's... We have five re first responders, and only three are very committed, but it's a burnout job. Um, I didn't want to renew my my first responder ticket because of that. Um, my assistant is a first responder right now, and she's getting burnt out because she has to do night first responding, and she has a job the next day. And that happens to most of our first responders. They have a job, and on top of that job, they first respond, and it's a burnout for our, for our first responders. Um, we're a community of 1,100, and we have a small clinic. Uh, and this time of the year, again, a doctor didn't come in yesterday, so we're lucky we see him once a week. Um, and the nurses, the same thing, due to weather, we're lucky we see them once a week. Um, our community is um, really growing. Uh, mm -hmm. From when I was a child, there was only about 200, and there's 1,100, and we have 2,400 members of our community now, today. And <laughs> we've had some... Uh, communications with our neighboring tribes. Uh, I was to share 
with the ladies this morning. We lost the chief in our next neighboring tribe, and our first responders had to respond to that. And it was really difficult for our first responders due to the situation that ha happened. And those are unforeseen thing, un things that some of our first responders see. Um, we had a, a death due to violence one year, and this is where our critical incident stress needs to be really worked with because my daughter was a first responder at that scene, and today she's still stu suffering with what she had to deal with that night. And uh, so those are some of the incidents that we've had. And uh, we had a guy up on a mountain for 12 hours. They went out hiking. Uh, took them 12 hours for them to take him down from the mountain. And he collapsed on the mountain. And it's about a four hour hike, but it took them 12 hours to get him down because the helicopter, Comox helicopter, couldn't find a landing spot for him so to get him out. So our guys had to go and rescue him. So there's a lot of incidents that have happened in our small community. Three weeks ago, we had a boating accident due to weather. Uh, there was 15 people on a boat. Three of them were injured. And so, again, our community had to respond to the emergency because the Coast Guard <laughs> didn't respond as quickly as our community. So those are issues that we have in our remote community. Um, I'll say it again. We're, we're really hoping and working down the line to get more health services in our community. Um, we'd love to have a full-time doctor or two in our community, but right now we're working on getting a nurse's station. I'm very grateful to NTC for helping work with that and uh, First Nations Health. So they've been a big help and I lost <laughs> for more words. Can you say a little bit about the, the meetings that you had and how you dealt with those meetings and um, I really feel the meetings that we've ha had have been very helpful because it's kind of moving us forward to looking into different places where we can access more services and work like working with NTC and getting our nurses station. And um, I know it's a long haul, but it's a start. And I really appreciate the group that has come in to learn about who we are as a people and what our needs are and uh, that you have a better understanding of who we are as the house at Heshkut, Kloakwit, and Kayukut, because um, we are ocean people, <laughs> and uh, we really appreciate, I'm going to say something, I got a call from Saskatchewan last, yesterday, from a doctor, he was asking me some questions, and I do you know what I said? I'm going to say something here. I said, our youth were getting surveyed out. I said, it seems like we're getting surveyed out with our health system. I said, I'm just being honest. I said, but I have to stop there because my dad said, this might be the right survey that will help you move forward in life. And I really believe this project that we're doing is helping us move forward with better health care. Mm -hmm. Thanks.
Thank you, Julia, for coming all the way down and, and giving us that perspective. Um, it really does put a real a real face to what we're trying to do in this sort of a setting. And, and you know, my hope is to try to help to educate other people on the needs and the realities. Um, it's interesting, and Julie was talking about, and there was a, a boating accident. Um, I don't know if you, if you remember um, a couple of years ago when that whale watching boat overturned. There wasn't a, an immediate response to that except from a how's it? And it was the mariners in a how's it? They're excellent mariners. They are coastal people and they they know the ocean. And it was them that went out and actually saved so many lives and prevented a lot more people from dying on, in that accident. And so they're uh, very committed to uh, to doing whatever needs to be done, but they need some help and some support. So as we were going through this project, particularly um, driven by Jeff Redding, who is one of our, our main um, team members, and uh, we, we started thinking about how we can do much more than just what this what we were funded to do, which was just discover. How can we go forward? And his suggestion was that we move forward with a fairly large uh, CIHR grant. And um, he's a guy that you listen to because he was the first scientific director of the Institute for Indigenous People's Health. And so, and he was on the review committee at that point. He was no longer the scientific director, but he was on the review committee. So he knew a lot about what the chances of, of us being able to do this. And so he pushed us. And we didn't know at the start, we were sort of, oh, I don't know. And um, uh, knowing what CIHR um, success rates are anyways, but, um, but he felt that, that we had like a really, really good chance of being able to do this. And this is how we would move it forward. So I wanna talk about that grant now. We're waiting to hear. We've put it in, and um, these meetings then kind of all built up, and we developed sort of a framework and a way of going forward. And I want to explain that and how that kind of research is different than what you might think of normally as research, and and how research can actually have more of an impact than just generating knowledge. So this is the Institute of Indigenous Peoples Health, and there's the sci current scientific director, Dr. Kerry Barasa. Something that Jeff actually built into their system is different than any of the other institutes. So there's the Institute of, of Cardiovascular and Respiratory Health, et cetera. And um, I think there are over a dozen institutes. And all of those other institutes, you put a grant in and they decide whether you're gonna be funded or not. And if you're not, that's it. And if you are, you get the money, usually with a bit of a cut in what you've asked for. But that's kind of the way the way I know it to be. But in in this case, because of the need for this, they actually put in a very different process. And that was that if you put your grant forward and you didn't really have all of the implementation and all of the methodology completely worked out in a way that's acceptable to indigenous peoples, but it was a good idea and it really had the potential to provide impact they would say to you, we're not gonna give you all the money that you've asked for, but we're gonna give you this reasonable chunk of money so over the next year, we can work with you and you can uh, refine your grant and develop it so that it is more fundable and more likely to be successful in the end. What a great, what a great way to deal with people that that was. I thought, wow, that's, that actually happens and that's true and Jeff has lots of experience in dealing with that. So that gave us some comfort going forward those of you that spend time it will know this if you spend time every night reading the Tri-Council Guidelines for Ethics and for Human Research, you'll know that there's a chapter nine that um, deals with specifically how you must perform research if you are dealing with indigenous issues and indigenous peoples, indigenous communities. And, um, and so um, there's a list of them there. I'll talk so that more, some of them in detail as we go forward, but it really is making sure you involve and respect the community and that you work with them every step of the way, all the way down to the interpretation and dissemination of the information. And um, it's, it's very clearly laid out. And it came from something that um, 
that I didn't know this at the start, but from something that happened to the Nuchalnath people that we're working with now. And this was um, an incident that happened in the 80s, and this anthropologist, Rick Ward, came to um, Nuchalnath people and, and got consent to take their blood because there was a lot of arthritis in the community. In those days, genetics wasn't as far established, but he took the blood to do genetic analysis and uh, see if there was clustering, see if there was ways that they could understand how, um, how uh, hereditary was, how fam if there was family clustering of arthritis, with the hope that they'd be able to then do something for those that were suffering in these communities. So they agreed, the blood got taken, time went by, and they didn't hear anything. And so they proactively went and got in touch with him to find out what had happened. He said, oh, we did the analysis, but we didn't find anything useful. But he hadn't got back to them to do that. Mm -hmm. Then this guy took the samples out of the country and continued some other genetic research without any discussion with the community, no consent from those who actually had, had allowed the blood to be taken. And they started studying the origins of indigenous peoples and made some interesting discoveries, published the findings. Um, and they, he also he took it to Oxford and he let other researchers come and use the blood for other stuff too, totally without letting the communities and those that had, had given their blood to um, that, that even that this was going on, let alone consent. And one of the core um, Nuchalnath beliefs is that when you die, you should actually leave this world with all of your body parts, including, including blood that have been taken away from you. So many of the people, by the time this was all gone, had passed on. And so that was very hard for the community. But eventually they recovered the blood, brought it back, and um, officially declared it and, and then destroyed the blood. Um, and, but the, the, and that's the picture at the bottom is, as a member of the community, actually that's the box with all the blood that, that they had collected, they, they had reclaimed and were bringing home. But the consequence of that was a total lack of trust in researchers and research. And that's where that chapter nine came from, that you cannot do this. This is not appropriate. And, um, and so I think the whole world has changed, but there is still some mistrust of researchers. So as we went forward, we put together an even bigger team, and you can see um, a lot of the names there. We had community members officially involved in the grant that's gone forward, so these people are all named in the grant as principal applicants and co-applicants um, from tribal council, from the communities, from um, FNHA, um, from all of our other partners, um, uh, Heart and Stroke, for instance. And, um, and all of these people had, um, were kept a, a Surprised as we built the grant and and could offer suggestions and and reflections and improvements if they wish to. Um, Rebecca Lee is here. I mentioned before that she was here and she's she works with Jeff very closely and so she is an early investigator and has a connection with UBC but has other connections with the Indigenous community as well through the iHeart program that's centered here at St. Paul's actually. So. Um, the aims were really to, for, for this research to be a driver of change and born from community voices and establishing trusting relationships and trying to avoid any power imbalances that um, could easily occur through shared governance, which is what we tried to do, um, with community members guiding it along the way. And, and we, when we had meetings, when we will have meetings in the future, we will always compensate people that find it difficult um, um, to, to get to meetings so that we don't have the imbalance that would naturally be there because some people find it hard to get there. So that has to be part of the grant as well. What we want to do is identify gaps with potential solutions and the priorities to which we can deal with that, all the while respecting community customs. And these are some of the things, some of the principles then that we incorporated into the grant. First of all, it's mixed methods. That, so the data we collect, some of it will be quantitative when we can do that, but a lot of it will be qualitative. And um, it'll be based on a model of implementation science. And um, I'm learning a lot about implementation science, not something that I've done a lot of before, 
um, but it's, it's really pretty cool, and it gets down to actually doing something instead of just discovering something. So there's a few of those principles sort of laid out a bit in a bit more detail here. So there's this concept um, in Indigenous research called two-eyed seeing, which I find, I find fascinating. So it's using one eye through the Indigenous lens and the other eye through the Western lens, and, um, but using both eyes together to get the best of both to be able to get to, to put together the best kind of project and respecting both. And the intergenerational experience and using uh, elders as experts um, in the execution and the interpretation, so their traditional knowledge, but also um, uh, it, it, making sure that we don't, um, that, that we, we really respect that knowledge and it becomes an inherent part of what we are trying to do. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Part of this is that you need to actually ensure that the resources go to communities. So in the grant, which is a pretty large grant, $1.9 million we, put, we asked for. I don't know what we, we'll ever get that. But 60% of that actually goes to people who are going to be helping to implement the grant in the communities. So 60% of that money actually goes to communities and that's part of the capacity developing, but also part of making sure that we have um, energy in the communities to be able to collect the information and to be able to do the, uh, the changes that we want. And it's all within this, within um, uh, NTC ethics protocols and principles, and the intellectual property rights are in agreement with OCAP, which is, I have to go down here, um, which is um, ownership control, um, access and possession so all the international the intellectual property lives with the community it doesn't live with any external researchers and in our second meeting we uh, actually asked the el an elder that was there um, what what indigenous name could we use for this project and what we're doing and so she right away it didn't take we thought we we're gonna have to do a whole process for months to figure out what to do and she just came up with this right away which means change she said that's what we should call this project. So it's changed for emergency care services in remote indigenous communities. I kind of talked about these already. Um, in this implementation science framework, when working with indigenous communities, it's a little bit different than our traditional way. Um, traditionally, we would try to prove something, prove a concept of something, and then put it into an implementation science framework and try to study how we would then implement it and whether it works or not. But um, in this indigenous framework and in indigenous communities, it's not necessary to do that. We respect the feelings, the thoughts, the understanding of elders and knowledge users who are the, is the community. But um, we hypothesize that the synthesis of that knowledge user driven interventions is actually a form of evidence. It comes from a strong base within the community. We don't have to do a preliminary trial to be able to prove it to then move on to implementation science. And that, um, that will, in fact, just as well as in our Western ways, ensure successful adoption of effective and appropriate interventions um, leading to improved emergency care. And there's a whole, there's a number of frameworks that we incorporated and we have helped us to kind of structure this grant. The first one that's most common is called EPIS, Exploration, Preparation, Implementation, and Sustainment. And this is those same kind of concepts, but it talks about the different stages of how you will do implementation research. The interagency collaborative model talks about how you do that with multiple stakeholders and within community. And then the First Nations holistic policy and planning model which is a very specific thing, puts community at its core and it and tries to ensure that you, you are thinking about, and we often don't do this very well in emergency medicine, um, that, that really in, incorporates the four aspects of wellness, um, spiritual, physical, emotional, and mental. And so we want to pay attention to all of those things as we move forward. Our timeline for this, it was uh, we're asking for funding for four years and we've already finished the first phase of that EPIS um, framework. So the exploration, that's really what we had done with the Strategic Investment Fund project. And so now as we start this project and we get the funding, hopefully. Hey, Russ. <laughs> 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 um, we'll move into the preparation phase. And so even though we have ideas about what we might want to do and the things that we can do, we're going to spend the first at least six months Again, going into communities and in detail, 
working with communities to find exactly what it is. How do we define it from the community perspective, the things that we want to change? And then we try to implement that over years two and three, and then in year four, we try to solidify the, um, the changes that we've made and the partnerships that we've developed. And we hope that the impact will be a foundational change in emergency care in these four communities, but more than that, will be create a model for other communities to utilize and um, a capacity for indigenous community-based research um, and a model for doing that. And in some way, maybe directly contribute to the truth and reconciliation process. We can't do this. A grant doesn't pay for the things that, there's some pretty big cost items here. So a grant is not gonna pay for um, you know, ongoing First Nation uh, responders to, to actually come out and get extra training or to put in communication infrastructure or um, more ambulances from and response from the ambulance service, for instance. So we needed to bring in implementation partners who are going to do that. And that's exciting about this too because it's, this research is more than just generating that new knowledge or showing how we can implement something. But we brought in these partners, First Nations Health Authority, will have to be with us every step of the way because some of the things will have to be funded through them. We're the only province that has a First Nations mm -hmm. Health Authority. So the, um, the federal funding, the majority of it, not all of it, comes through First Nations Health Authority, which then distributes it across the province. BC Emergency Health Services, and they're really with us in a strong way. Heart and Stroke, who really want to do, um, take care of things related to um, uh, community readiness. So we're already talking about things that we might be able to do, we think are probably going to be acceptable, which is to train um, high school kids in these communities for first aid and, um, and CPR and in the community as well. And then tell us, of course, from the information infrastructure. And the concept of research, we try to keep quite low key. We tried to make the point at the very first meeting that we had, we are not here to do research. We are here to try to improve emergency care in your communities. And research is just a tool to help us do that. And that's a little different way, again, from an academic perspective of, of looking at research. Lots of challenges, making sure we have common understanding of the expectations. And there are little agendas here and there. There's a little bit of politics that goes on within NTC communities. Julia's laughing. Yeah, so um, it's sometimes hard that not everybody's necessarily on the same page. What do, we, how, what do we do? We have expectations now. What can we follow through if we don't get funding from CIHR? We have to think about that. Will we lose trust and engagement if we sort of go too long in, in silent mode um, without sort of actively working at things? Um, working within the community governance structures can sometimes be challenging. And this concept that we want to make sure, and it's just not another way of saying what I've said a couple times already, um, nothing about us without us. And scope creep's a big one too because there's lots more health needs other than emergency care. And, but we can't be all things to all people. So, hey, Brian. Um, and then the, um, the fear of institutions I talked about before, that's still there. And then holistic view of health is something we have to pay attention to. Now, just we haven't actually done any implementation yet, but there have been some things that have happened. I don't know if it's because we were starting these conversations and doing it in any way, but we, there, there are a few things. The first one I told you about, the first responders um, have access now to paramedic specialists. That was because we had that meeting and the um, EHS was there and heard all of these comments about what might be helpful. And so they went ahead and did that. We developed trusting relationships. Um, we brought a lot of partners together and those partners that I told you about, we have letters of commitment that they'll be part of this going forward. In a house it, for instance, uh, no, sorry, in, in um, uh, the, our, our, well, a house it, and actually I'm not sure, I sort of was thinking maybe I had this wrong, but the house it first responders and the Hesh Group first responders are now working together, which they had never done before. They had been in isolation. Now they're working together to try to support each other. And um, you can see up there in Cayuquit, there's a, a van there. So they didn't have any kind of ambulance to move patients around. And, and Heshkwit still is in this situation. So if they have somebody that they need to take down to the dock to get on a boat to get out somewhere, how do they get them there? They put them in a wheelbarrow. That's the transport, the local transport. So there was nobody going to step forward with an ambulance. How does it have an ambulance? Trouble is it doesn't work, and there's nobody there to fix it. So it doesn't, it's not useful. In a house that they bought a van, got it brought, brought in, 
And, um, and BCEHS worked with them, gave them a stretcher, and put the, a mechanism in the van that they can lock a stretcher into that so they can move a patient um, down to the dock if they have to do that, or to the nursing station, for instance. And we found out just in the past couple of months that a house had got a cell tower, and this was another interesting thing. So the communications are already strengthening there, and that surprised us because an initial, initially we were talking to TELUS and we were talking to Housit, and they were working with another cell provider to try to put some other infrastructure in, and I'm not sure how it was going, but they, they were trying to work with it, and TELUS told us, well, we can't really step in there because they're working with somebody else. And then all of a sudden, bingo, two months ago, we heard that TELUS had put in a cell tower. So I don't know. So we think there's hope for the future um, and improving the care I think it's an important thing for us to be doing, and it really does speak to our mandate of trying to improve emergency care across the province. So I'll stop now, and you can ask me or ask Julia any questions. I think we have a little bit of time left, a little bit anyway. So any questions? Do you have any questions on the computer, Gentile? Can you guys keep an eye on the people out there, because I can't really turn around and see them if somebody's waving. So any thoughts, questions, comments? Did you all have a coffee this morning? <laughs> okay. I hope I've given you something to think about. I hope Julia has given you something to think about. And um, get a coffee and get ready for the next uh, the grand, the grand rounds for St. Paul's. So thank you very much for listening. this last one but the one before he said if ever you're in Vegas yeah. so I'm gonna fuck it. I think I've got his card somewhere I'm gonna yeah probably but um, yeah I know it'll be a good one yeah I'll get for you do, do you have his info his contact info if I can't no no okay maybe I'll, I'll contact uh, Jeff Jeff Mike 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 I know. So I, I never find it very easy dealing with them. Yeah, he's I, I, I feel like an intern again. I mean, uh, your judgment is questioned all the time. Yeah. If you give the suspension too long or too short, you're looking too short. Can you download it or does it have to be a question? You know, like it's, I feel like I'm a, a resident. Yeah. 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 Uh, like no, like Lawrence is not gonna. You don't go over time, ha ha. I'm like, I'm like, I know it's not a joke. When are we supposed to finish? When did it land? Eleven. Oh, okay. You have a long presentation too. Hey, good job on that, Jim. That's really interesting. On my way here. Ha <laughs> ha 
I'm trying to get back. Oh. Hi. So we have both our presentations over here. Oh, okay. Can I see my notes? If, um... And then if you have if you do... Um... You guys sit close. Why? Right at you. Maybe we don't really. Yeah. Uh, uh, that do it, huh? Uh, no, there must be a way. Chat, someone? Uh, a way. Yeah, I think you I have to use And then after. Maybe Ben now. Oh. oh, there. Your notes are going to be here. Because you don't have notes on this one. So we'll just have to flip it around. So your notes are going to have to go there. Ready? No, we can. There's a way to flip this around. Okay. Uh, Call will be disconnected. No. <laughs> 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 